Good day, everyone, and we are the Group 4, and we are here to discuss the topic that we are assigned, which is the Coreg 72, Rule 11 to 14. In this course, MTech 102, this prelim period, Week 1, Session 1. So the Group 4 presenters are Decadet Pogdas Lara Justin, Decadet Caniete Benz Audrey, and De Decadet Casalatan Sicilieto Jr. Jr. So the course outcome for this lesson is that the learner should be able to recognize the traffic separation scheme and determine the appropriate actions to be, take, to be taken in certain situations using the, call, the rules in call reg 72. And the learning outcome for this session is that the, at the end of the lesson, students should be able to understand the call reg 72, rule 11 to 14, and its application. And for the importance of the topic is that students will be able to understand the Core Reg 72, Rule 11 to 14, and its application, and the students will be able to determine the appropriate actions to be taken in certain situations. So the Core Reg 72, Rule 11 to 14, is located at the Part B, which is the Steering and Sailing Rules, in the subpart 2 or Section 2, the conduct of vessels inside of one another. In the Rule 11, which is the application, rules in the section apply to the vessels inside of one, one another. So the Rule 12 will be discussed by Decadet Kogtas Lara Justin. Thank you, Decadet Gasalatan. So for the Rule 12, entitled Sailing Vessels. So from the title itself, Sailing Vessels means this rule is only applicable for sailing vessels only. From the definition, sailing vessels means any vessel under sail provided that propelling machinery, if fitted, is not being used. The sailing vessel relies on the power of the wind, may it be windward or leeward. Paragraph A. When two sailing vessels are approaching on one another so as to involve risk, risk of collision, one of them shall keep out of the way of the other as follows. This statement clearly states that if two sailing vessels are visible to each other, there is a risk of collision. One of the, those sailing vessels should keep out of the way to, uh, to avoid collision. Paragraph 1. When each has the wind on the different side, the vessel which has the wind on the port side shall keep out of the way of the other. This means that when two sailing vessels are approaching one another, there is a risk of collision so they need to perform an action. One of them should be the giveaway vessel. Since they are approaching one another, it is easy to determine which vessel should be the giveaway. If, vessel, if the vessel's wind is on the port side, then that vessel is the giveaway vessel and must keep out of the way. Paragraph 2. When both have the wind on the same side, the vessel which is to windward shall keep out of the way of the vessel which is to leeward. If both vessels have the wind on the same side, the vessel which is to windward shall take an action, since it is said that the windward vessel is normally the more maneuverable vessel. Windward is the sailing vessel that is closer to where the wind is coming from, and the leeward is the wind is the downwind from the other vessel or is away from where the wind is coming from. For the paragraph 3, if a vessel with a wind on the port side sees a vessel to windward and cannot determine with certainty whether the other vessel has the wind on the port side or on the starboard side, she shall keep out of the way of the other. So this statement is already self-explanatory. Self For the paragraph B, for the purpose of this rule, the windward side shall be deemed to be the side opposite that on which the main sail is carried or in the case of a square rigged vessel. The side opposite to that on which the largest fore and aft sail is carried. Here we have the main sail. It's hanging off the main mast. It's actually on the boom. To determine the windward side, we need to determine which side she's carrying this sail. It's actually quite hard from this angle to determine. The only thing we'd be able to go on would be that possibly this flag astern telling us the wind direction and actually because it's right in the centre of the ship it's very hard to tell. Let's have a look at the next image. Okay so this image is a bit more of a classic yacht. We've got two different sails. We've got this forward sail here 
that for the purposes of the rule, this sale has no impact at all. We are interested in the one astern of her mast, this one here. This is her mainsail. And we need to try and work out on what side it's carried. To me, it looks like she's carrying the mainsail on her port side, which means the wind is coming from her starboard side. You can tell just by looking at these images, it's actually very hard to tell where the wind is coming from. Let's try the next one. OK, so in this picture, we're starting to look at some square rigged sails. You've got these sails here on the mast, which are the square rigged ones. These are not to be used for trying to work out what side the wind is from. They're a very good indication, but as per the rule, they don't define which is her windward side. We're looking for the largest fore and aft sail. These sails are running in a fore and aft direction. This sail in here is also running in a fore and aft direction. And this sail at the stern is running in a fore and aft direction. To me, this one looks like the largest one, so we're going to use that to determine on which side the windward side is. From this picture, it looks like that sail is hanging over the starboard side of her vessel, so that means she has the wind on her port side. This actually ties in with all the other sails, but we're having to use the largest fore and aft sail to actually determine it. Let's have a look at the next picture. OK, so this picture is a much larger square rigged vessel. You can see she's got loads of large square sails on each and every mast, which, unfortunately, for the purposes of the rule, we cannot use to determine on which side she's carrying the wind. We know just by looking at it, they're a brilliant indication, and they're actually showing that the wind's on the port side, but we can't use that according to the rule. We're looking at the combination of all the fore and aft sails in all the positions, trying to work out which one is the largest one to determine on which side the wind is. Luckily, all the sails are hanging over the starboard side, including this one, which to me looks like the largest fore and aft sail. So we know she's got the wind on her port side. So the next presenter will be Kanyete Vance Audrey. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, the Cadet Cogtas. So now let us proceed to discussing the Rule 13, which is overtaking. So this rule is still under the Part B, um, Section 2, which is the conduct of vessel in sight of one another. So for us to understand more of this rule, we, we will discuss about its paragraphs. So it is divided into four paragraphs. So let's start with the paragraph A. Notwithstanding anything contained in the rules of Part B, Sections 1 and 2, any vessel overtaking any other shall keep out of the way of the vessel being overtaken. So um, the rules that is under the Section 1 and 2 of Part B call regs cannot override the Rule 13, but Rule 13 can override the rules from uh, Section 1 to 2, which is Rule 4 to 8, because this rule have a special rule that deprives the ability of the other vessel to be associated with this certain situation. Now, so, uh, these are the rules that can be overrided by the Rule 13. Please proceed with the video. These include lookout, safe speed, risk of collision, action to avoid collision, narrow channels, traffic separation schemes, sailing vessels, head-on situations, crossing situations, giveaway vessels, stand-on vessel, and responsibilities between vessels. All of these cannot override the responsibilities given to a vessel under Rule 13. Oh, seeking a little back a little more on this rule, let's proceed to the paragraph B. B. So a vessel shall be deemed to be overtaking when coming up with another vessel from a direction more than 22.5 degrees above her beam. That is, in such a position with reference to the vessel she is overtaking. At night, she would be able to see only the stern light of that vessel, but neither of her side lights. So in line with this, part C is somehow connected with, uh, with these paragraphs. Paragraph C says, when a vessel is in any doubt as to whether she is overtaking another, she shall assume that this is the case and act accordingly. That seems so a lot of words, but let's break down its meaning. So back to the paragraph B, please. <clears throat> so 
paragraph B says that a vessel is will be considered to be overtaking when she is coming from 22.5 degrees above the beam of the vessel she is overtaking. So as we all know, vessels are equipped with lights and these lights have its um, range in which it can only be seen. At night, an overtaking will only see an overtaking vessel will only see the stern light of the vessel uh, of the vessel that overtaking can be either be in the starboard side or port side as long as it is 22.5 degrees above her beam. If it moves across the 22.5 degrees forward, it will be considered as a crossing situation. So a strange um, situation that comes is when a vessel comes from the 22.5 degrees um, degrees radius from your own ship and it decreases its range. So there is a risk of collision. So looking a bit more of this rule, it says that it, if it has to be more than 22.5 degrees um, radius for you to be considered as an overtaking vessel. So if if this uh, situation happens, it is when the paragraph C kicks in. So paragraph C, when we look at paragraph C, it says that when a vessel is in any doubt as to whether she is overtaking another, she shall assume that this is the case and act accordingly. Yes, we should act accordingly even if uh, the vessel will not overtake you, uh, we should be uh, one step ahead to, prov uh, to prevent any um, risk, risk of collision. So leading to the last paragraph of this rule, it says that in any subsequent alteration of the bearing between the two vessels shall not make the overtaking vessel a crossing vessel within the meaning of these rules or relieve her of the duty of keeping clear of the overtaking vessel until she is finally passed and clear. So in this situation when uh, overtaking procedure, uh, overtaking situation is can be seen, overtaking vessel serves as the giveaway vessel and the uh, overtaken vessel stands as the stand-on vessel. So any um, alteration of the course or any actions that is made by the overtaking vessel should not make the stand-on vessel the giveaway vessel. Just like for example, when the overtaking vessel uh, moves past through the vessel that she is overtaking, um, she shall not cross the course of the vessel uh, that is being overtaken, making the Stand on vessel, the giveaway vessel. Thank you so much. And the next rule would be rule 14. And let's hear it out from Decadet Gasalatan. Thank you, Decadet Kaniate, for the discussion of the rule 13. So for the rule 14, which is the head-on situation, it states in the part A, unless otherwise agreed when two power-driven vessels are meeting in reciprocal or nearly reciprocal courses, so as to involve risk of collision, each shall alter her course to starboard so that each shall pass on the port side of the other. This rule is only applicable to power-driven vessels only. In this rule, the situation is where both vessels are meeting in reciprocal or nearly reciprocal course, like 180 on each other. For example, one is going north and one is going south. And they need to be approaching so as to involve in risk of collision. So if the risk of collision does not exist, you don't need to apply this rule. And it says that each shall alter its course to starboard so each shall pass in the port side of the other. It is telling both vessels to take action, which means in this rule, both, vessel, both vessels are giveaway vessels and in, it, and in the head-on situation, there is no stand-on vessel. So to properly explain, this is the illustration to visualize what it looks like. Okay, taking this diagram, we'll have a blue vessel down at the bottom of the screen. She's going along quite happily, heading due north, 000. Then she sees the red vessel up ahead. Now the red vessel, they know that they're going due south, 180. So 
So these two are actually meeting on reciprocal courses. First thing they need to establish is whether risk of collision exists. To do that, they've got to continue to monitor for a little while. After a while, they've established the bearing between them is not changing, so they know risk of collision exists. They also know they're in sight of one another, they know they're both power-driven vessels, and they're meeting on reciprocal courses. Therefore, this is a head-on situation within the meaning of the rules. As per the first part of the rule, both vessels shall alter their course to starboard, so that each shall pass on the port side of the other. Once they've altered round to starboard, of course, the port side light is visible from both vessels. They can continue past each other until risk of collision is over and they're finally passed and clear, at which point they're free to alter back round to port and continue on their previous passage. So for the part B, such situation shall be deemed to exist when a vessel sees the other ahead or nearly ahead by the night she could see the mass headlights of the other in line or, or nearly in line or both side lights and by the day she observes the corresponding aspects of the other vessel. So the part B tells us when the head-on situation exists, such situation shall deem to exist when a vessel sees the other ahead. It basically said that you need to see the other one ahead, which makes sense since it's a head-on situation. And the mass headlights needs to be aligned or nearly in line, and by the day, it would be the same aspect. And for the part C, when a vessel is in any doubt as to whether such situation exists, she shall assume that it does exist and act accordingly. So if you're in doubt, if it is a head-on situation, then you need to assume that it is a head-on situation and act accordingly. So to properly explain, this is the illustration to visualize what it looks like in the Part B and Part C paragraph. So at night it would be complete darkness. You would see the mast headlight, which is the main mast, which is the after one, and then the foremast, which is the forward one, would be lower than the after one. You'd also see a port side light and a starboard side light. Seeing both side lights means that the ship is coming straight towards you. You can see straight on her bow. As she turns around slightly, you can see the mast headlights will gradually start to separate. The green side light, of course, will still be very visible. And for a time, the port one will, but obviously it'll be getting dimmer as she's turning and covering it. As she turns yet further still, separation between the mast headlights will increase, the port side light will disappear, and only the starboard side light will be visible. This will carry on until she's right out on the beam, on the broadest possible aspect, and this will be the maximum separation between the two mast headlights. Of course, in this situation, she would be going right from the left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side of the screen. Of course, in the daytime, you'd be seeing the corresponding aspect of the vessel, either head-on or uh, intervals until she is right out on the beam. Once again, we are the group four with Decadet Lara Justin Cogtas, Benson Recanete, and Cecilia Togasinatan Jr. Thank you for listening.